Hello there, welcome back. Today on Daddy Rolled a One, we're gonna be talking about the history of firearms in Dungeons and Dragons and in other early tabletop role-playing games. Please remember to like and subscribe. And if you could please share this video on your social media networks, that's the best way for me to grow my channel. So to get started talking about firearms, we are gonna talk about two games that came Prior to D&D, they were instrumental in the development of D&D. There were other games involved as well. I'm only going to be talking about these two. So the first one is going to be Dave Arneson's Blackmore. We've talked about this book a lot. Uh, this was actually published post D&D 1977. This is called First Fantasy Campaign by Dave Arneson, published by Judges Guild. However, this is really Dave Arneson's notes from his Blackmore game that predates D&D. So as we all remember, Blackmore is a game that is not quite a role-playing game, but it's very, very close. It has a lot of elements that we would associate with role-playing as we call it now. And it derived out of a game called Bronstein, and there was another game called Brownstone. They were all kind of related. Dave Arneson describes Blackmore the first time that he advertises uh, for players for the, the, his Blackmore game. He describes it as a medieval-type Bronstein game. However, in this game, Black, Blackmore really starts to get into a little bit more of what we would now call science fantasy elements. So if you look at the back here, he describes the original Blackmore magic system. We've talked about that before in my video on the magic system of D&D. And then he has this thing, this area here called description of magical items, which is really funny because in the table of contents, it's actually labeled as being the uh, description of mechanical marvels you see that there okay but here it's it's relabeled as description of magical items but if you see these items illusion projector skimmer a borer for digging through material a screener a tricorder a medical unit uh he's got an inter entertainer uh but he's also got robots and then a controller to control the robots so again much more of a sinus fantasy uh, type of situation if you see on the covers of the DA series of modules that Dave Arneson wrote for TSR in the mid 80s, um, you definitely get that sense of that science fantasy element. OK, so uh, that is uh, Blackmore. So there's no specific what, you know, standard like medieval type firearms in here. But clearly, Dave Arneson is accepting of kind of like a lot of different influential resources into his Blackmore game. Now, Chainmail. This is 1971. This is Rules from Medieval Miniatures by Gary Gygax and his friend Jeff Perrin. So just as a fun aside, in case you forgot about this or didn't remember, um, uh, the land of Perrin land in the world of Greyhawk that is named after Jeff Perrin. That's where that comes from. So this is Medieval Miniatures rules. And there are rules in here for gunpowder weapons. OK, so it talks all about that here, rate of fire and, and damage. Uh, in this particular case, uh, anybody who's hit uh, just dies automatically. That's how this system of combat works. It's not the standard D&D &D system that we think of today. And then, of course, in Chainmail, we have the fantasy supplement in the back here. And we know that Dave Arneson did incorporate some of the elements from this part of Chainmail. Uh, into his Blackmore game before it was all presented to Gary Gygax, who then kind of collated it and all and helped to write the D&D game that we know in 1974. Now, the fantasy supplement, it doesn't necessarily say that you can use um, firearms, but it's this system is just a tack on to the system at the front of this book. So in, and in theory, it talks about heroes and Heroes uh, depend on what kind of uh, armor and weapons that they have. So in theory, one of those could be like um, an aquabus because that is listed in the chainmail rules. So it also talks about wizard missiles and it relates them back to uh, the, uh, the firearms in the front of the book. So the lightning bolt is described as having an attack value equal to a heavy field gun. So that is kind of where you start to see where Gary's head is at in this and that he's he's describing magic in terms of how it relates to the medieval siege weaponry that was discussed in the front part of the book. So in Gary's mind, at least, I think he's starting to kind of create the situation again where magic is sort of maybe a replacement 
for farms. It doesn't say that specifically, but just the way that he's describing the terms um, it, and then other things that happen in the future, that starts to become a little bit more um, like it's probably what he was thinking. Now, in the back of this book, there's the uh, attack matrices. So you've got your fantasy reference table here. And you also have your fantasy combat table. But before that, you have your regular combat tables, and it has the individual fires with missiles. And there you see is the Aquabus. Okay, so that's Chainmail. However, by the time you get to D&D, so just a few years later, three years later, D&D is published, and there are no firearms in original D&D. It was these three original books. And the firearms aren't discussed in here. However, interestingly we do see firearms show up in Greyhawk Supplement 1 by Gary Gygax. This is 1975, January of 1975, so about a year after the original D&D is published. And if you see this table of weapons here, you see the Aquabus. And all these numbers that you're seeing here, this is the ranges for the weapons. For the Okay, but over here, this is the um, supplemental damage by weapon type, which was not how D&D combat was originally created in the original rules. This is the option rule. So the D&D combat system that we use this day all the way up till fifth edition actually goes back to the alternative combat system that was listed in original D&D. So Gary puts this table in here for all these new weapon types, but he doesn't include the Aquabus that he has over here. So now a lot of people have said that that might have just been either a mistake, either he left it out, but other people think that he might have accidentally lifted this table up from the chainmail supplement because he he took out cannons because chainmail has uh, you know field cannons, but it does it also has aquabus and so he may have lifted this up by mistake because it's never in here and it's never repeated anywhere else in any future you know early D and D game supplements and so. There's a lot of people that just think that's just a pure mistake, and Gary didn't mean to put that in there. Okay, so we've got the Aquabus. So, um, but again, not a lot of detail. So, um, what else is going on in this time? Well, 1975, the same year this comes out, you have Tunnels and Trolls is published. So, uh, I talk about Tunnels and Trolls in some of my earlier videos, uh, like the early tabletop role playing game settings, and also the World's second RPG that's published. And uh, Tunnels and Trolls originally, as you see here, doesn't have firearms. However, there is a fifth edition of the game that's published in 1982. And by this point, it's, um, there are firearms listed here. And it's, it's actually very detailed. It's toward the end of the book. So it doesn't come in the main section on the weapons and equipment. It comes toward the end and it talks about all these different types of firearms and how really they should be limited to sort of like a certain time period of European weaponry that was used. But it, it also gives um, the game master approval to like add a, do different types of guns and, and calibers and things like that. So um, that's Tunnels and Trolls. And then you have RuneQuest, 1978. There are no um, uh, firearms in that game. And then in 1979, you have this game. This is Adventures in Fantasy. Now, this is published by Dave Arneson. And this is after he's left TSR. And this was Dave's way of kind of like fixing what he thought were the problems in D&D. So a big part of the introduction of this game is him talking about how their D&D is actually not really well presented. It's very difficult to learn. And unless you have someone kind of teach it to you. And so he's going to fix that in Adventures in Fantasy. So, however... This particular game, it really doesn't lean into that sort of science fantasy stuff that he was doing in his Blackmore campaign. So it kind of skews a much more closely to what we would call a traditional fantasy setting. So there are other games, of course, coming out all throughout the 70s after D&D comes out. I'm trying to focus on just the fantasy ones because obviously games that take place in a modern setting or in a science fiction type setting are going to have firearms or, or some type of gun or ray gun or something like that in them if it's science fiction. So I'm, I'm leaving those out specifically and I'm focusing on 
what we would call a so you know a so-called traditional fantasy setting and how are they implementing the use of firearms if they are and really they pretty much aren't so D kind of leads the way by not having them in the game and then the popular games that come out afterwards like we talked about tunnels and trolls and rune quests don't have them now again tnt does add them later tnt tunnels and trolls adds firearms at some point you know by the fifth edition OK, so another game, though, this is kind of a more obscure one that's not really um, one that people remember all that well, but it's called High Fantasy. This is 1978. This is a game by a man named Jeffrey Dillon, and he had played D&D and kind of just decided he wanted to create his own version. So this kind of almost like an early heartbreaker, uh, if people are familiar with that term. So. Uh, he he wanted to write his own version of D&D. And so he worked with his wife and created like 100 copies that they sold at a convention. And then they used the money from that to make a second edition. And then it actually got purchased by another game company and had much more mass distribution. But one of the elements that he has in this game is a class called the Alchemist. And as you see here, Alchemists have the ability to use explosives and gunpowder. And the rules specifically say that only Alchemists should be able to use those. And... Um, and, and so, uh, but it, but it was a, an early part of the game. So this is 1970, only four years after D and D comes out and you've already got, um, a fantasy game it and it, it's a traditional, what I would call traditional fantasy game that includes early firearms, uh, in the form again of these kind of alchemists, which I guess kind of makes sense a little bit. All right, one more game that I'm going to talk about is sort of a traditional fantasy setting. It's going to be this one from 1986. This is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, published by Games Workshop. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Games Workshop, see my video on the Fiend Folio and the history of TSR UK's division. Uh, it talks about Games Workshop, very important company in the history of tabletop gaming. So this game comes out in 1986. It is a you know, mostly traditional fantasy type setting. However, there are character types in here that use firearms, such as the duelist. And you see here as trappings is a pair of dueling pistols with powder and ammunition. There's a highwayman who also has a pair of pistols with powder and ammo and a, a gunner who has um, skills as with blunderbuss, bomber, pistol and bombs. And then there's a list of weapons here, missile weapons that include the pistol and the blunderbuss, which is just in this particular version of the game, the blunderbuss is just a bigger version of a pistol. So you've got that, which, you know, again, like a traditional setting, as I mentioned, I'm not really going to talk about games that are modern settings, Wild West or spies or like the game gangbusters, anything like that, because of course they're going to have firearms. Space games, fantasies or science fiction games are going to have futuristic uh, hand weapons and firearms, like laser pistols and things like that. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about traditional, quote unquote, traditional fantasy settings that have firearms and some of these early games and how they start. You you see some of these games are starting to implement them and maybe as a way to distinguish themselves from d and not really sure. But d and does kind of set the tone. But then you start to see these other games starting to incorporate them. So let's talk about why. Why? did early D&D &D not have firearms? Unfortunately, the answer isn't super easy because it really seems that it comes down to Gary Gygax didn't want them in the game because he didn't feel that firearms fit the aesthetic that he was going for as, as the inspirational and influential text that he read, fantasy text that he read, um, that he includes in the list here. And, you know, the Appendix N, we've talked about this before in the AD&D &D guide, Dungeon Master's Guide, where he lists in Appendix N all those in, in inspirational texts. And when you think about it, you know, Conan and Fafra and the Grey Mouser and Elrock, um, Elric from the Michael Moorcock stories, or even, you know, Tolkien, all of those Gary lists as inspirational to him. None of those characters use firearms. It's not part of the, the way that those worlds are set up. And Gary seems to indicate when you kind of read between the lines when he's asked about firearms, that's why. He's modeling his world building on those early stories. And to him, it just didn't make sense to have firearms in them. So that's fine. It's just it's not always a necessarily clear and definitive answer, which is very typical of Gary. 
um, it, because it doesn't also involve game mechanics. So was there a game mechanics reason for firearms not being in there? Uh, some people have suggested this. They've just said, like, well, it doesn't make sense because if you get shot, you would die automatically. And, you know, you don't want to have like a one shot, one kill type of weapon. But that's not necessarily true because if you get, you know, stabbed with a broadsword, you're going to die just as easily. Right. So it, it, that argument really never has made sense. Um, other people said, well, it's really that, you know, magic kind of replaces firearms. I think there's a little bit of that, as we saw in the way Gary was describing how magic worked in the fantasy supplement of chainmail. So I think that's part of it as well. But it really seems to come down to Gary just feeling that firearms don't fit how he wanted a fantasy world to work in his, you know, in his thinking. Uh, however, um, he's not always consistent. So uh, I forgot to pull this off the shelf, but in the late seventies, there was an adventure uh, written by Gary and run at a few different tournaments and then later published by TSR. This is S3 Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. If you've not played this adventure and you don't want to be surprised because there's a huge spoiler alert coming out, I guess skip to the next chapter in the video. Just get past this or I guess, you know, if you needed to stop watching or something. But I'm going to do a big spoiler here. And that spoiler is that um, this adventure takes place uh, in the um, bowels of a crashed spaceship that crash lands on Greyhawk. And um the adventurers are hired to go investigate of course they don't realize it's a spaceship they all they know is that there's weird creatures around they go and find it you know quote unquote metal cave and they go investigate and there are um futuristic weapons in there not firearms like you know the kind that we have now but um there are like you know laser guns and things like that and the characters have to figure out how to use them by using uh these fun tables because while well, the player might have a context and go, oh, I know what that is. The character wouldn't. And so you have to use these tables to figure out if they're smart enough to operate the weapon without accidentally shooting themselves with it. So uh, Gary clearly was okay with having, uh, you know, being open to having parts of the game that, um, that, that fit, uh, you know, that kind of science fantasy thing that we talked about with Blackmore. So Gary did do that, um, even though he then, you know, it, it kind of really doubles down a lot of times on this idea um, of, you know, this traditional fantasy setting, not having stuff like that. So uh, we have this, uh, we're going to jump forward now to August of 1979. This is an article written in Dragon Magazine by Alan Hammock. Alan Hammock is a game designer at TSR. If you're not familiar with him, see my video on the Assassin class. I talk about him there. Um, but he uh, wrote a lot of different articles and uh, an adventure for a game called Boot Hill, a Wild West game. And so he writes this article here called Six Guns and Sorcery, which in which he talks about how uh, characters from a Wild West setting could end up in a DD and d campaign setting or vice versa. And it totally makes sense. TSR published both of these games, so they're doing some cross-promotion. So he writes this whole article on here. But at then, then at the end, you see he talks about not wanting to have gunpowder mudding the waters of your campaign setting. Well, what's really interesting is that um, if you saw my video where I reviewed the first edition Advanced Dungeon, uh, Dungeon Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide, I talked about how those sections, uh, Six Guns and Sorcery, and then also Mutants and Magic, were always some of my favorite sections um, of this book because I just found them very inspirational. And I never realized that they actually weren't written by Gary. Uh, they were written by Alan Hammett. Gary picks this up and basically just reprints this article here from the Alan Hammock one you saw right here, including the section at the end on the transferal of firearms to the AD&D campaign. Unless you want to have gunpowder mudding the waters of your fantasy world, it's strongly urged that the boot hoof firearms uh, be, be confined to specific areas. And when gunpowder is brought into the fantasy world, it becomes inert junk. So, um, I always took those to be Gary's words, and and most people did. Most people said, "Well, well, Gary says right here why um he doesn't why he doesn't want to have firearms in the game, but he actually doesn't. All he says is if you don't, you know, unless you want them mudding the waters of your fantasy campaign, he doesn't really give rationale for why. He just says like this is why you know you shouldn't do it, and here's how to prevent that from happening. It just becomes inert junk. So again, not. It's, it's really vague in terms of why he didn't think that that made sense to have those in a game. But there you go. So um, that is an article uh, from 1979. 
Now let's jump forward a few more years to Dragon Magazine issue number 60. This is April of 1982, and this is an article written by Ed Greenwood, the creator of the Forgotten Realms campaign, arguably D&D's most famous campaign setting. And this article he writes is about firearms. Now, what's really interesting is that Ed Greenwood was writing articles for Dragon Magazine. And in hindsight, we now know all of those articles had their basis in his Forgotten Realms campaign. The realms aren't mentioned until way later. OK, but all of those articles are are things that are included in the realms. And Ed confirmed this. There was a, someone on Twitter asked him back in 2017, hey, are firearms part of the realms? Like, what's the deal with that? And Ed said, like, yeah, they're totally part of the realms. See the article that I wrote in Dragon Magazine issue number 60 and issue number 70, which we'll talk about in a second. But he confirmed firearms are part of the realms. The reason that they don't get published when the realms get purchased by TSR because the TSR execs didn't want to have firearms. So Jeff Grubb comes up with this workaround that he calls smoke powder instead of gunpowder. So Ed's like, gunpowder doesn't work in the realms, but smoke powder does. So um, that was kind of their, their goofy workaround. But firearms are technically part of, of the realms. So Ed writes a follow-up article, issue number 70, where he talks about um, more kind of like personal uh, firearms, whereas the issue number 60 was more of kind of like the large uh, scale, like, you know, field guns and siege uh, type guns. Issue number 70 gets down to more of like the, the personal weapons that would be handled by an individual. So, but in between those two, Dragon Magazine issue number 66, uh, this is um, also 1982, October, Gary uh, writes a letter to the editor of Dragon Magazine that is published. So the the uh, it says Gary on gunpowder, and he says, "Dear editor, with regard to gunpowder in the D and D or A D and D game systems, I wish to point out the following: the rules contain no provision to use uh, for the use of such materials. In general, gunpowder will not work. That is because it functions on a scientific principle, and as every adventurer knows, the fables of science and technology are sometimes found in strange areas. But the laws of magic are such that no one can possibly believe in these arcane pursuits." They never produce results. So there's no comment back from the editors or anything like that. But uh, again, very typical of Gary's language where he, you know, uses eight words to say one. Um, but basically, he just just saying like, nope, like he doesn't see that uh, magic or, or that firearms would work in a fantasy setting because he didn't write any rules for doing so. So they're not in there. That means they're not part of the game. So that's fine. It, that's that's kind of interesting. But we're going to jump forward again a little bit now. So we're going to go up to 1989. So at this point, Gary Gygax has left TSR. And its second edition game is published. This is the second edition player's handbook, 1989. And in the section on equipment, you see the Aquabus which is, again, an early firearm. And then you see those three dots there. It says, this weapon is available only if allowed by the DM. But it's part of the game. So the Aquabus and firearms come into second edition if your DM allows it. Okay, And then they have this really fun book that came out in second edition. I love these green historical guides uh, that came out for second edition. I have quite a few of them. This was the first one I got, A Mighty Fortress. And this is made for um, playing d d in a European setting from 1550 to 1650. So, of course, it's chock full of stuff on firearms. So, I mean, it's not the only thing that's in here, but firearms are part of this game because they were part of life. And this game, this supplement is for replicating an historical type campaign. So I bought it to get these rules. because I didn't want to play an actual European campaign. I just wanted rules and ideas for putting that time period into my home campaign setting. So this is a uh, second edition D&D. Now, um, third edition, they're not really part of the game so much, but you start to see um, Gary's being interviewed a lot early 2000s. So two main places he's being interviewed is going to be Ian World and then also dragonsfoot.org. And so in 2002, there was an interview with Gary Gygax on Ian World and people were asking him about firearms in the game. And he said he found them counter to the spirit of the game and that they were quite unnecessary. So that's 2002. Then in 2003, you have this book published. So uh, there was a whole series of these Gary Gygax's whatever. And this one's the living fantasy, but there were, there was a whole bunch of these. And this is published by Troll Lord Games. And in here, this is basically the folks at Troll Lords uh, working with Gary to kind of capture his 
idea of what a, what a fantasy campaign setting should be for a fantasy role playing game. Gary is now at this point being very, very specific about what's in and what's out and what you need to do. And so this is kind of a fun book. Um, the writing is a little dry, but it really it gets in. You know, I mean, you see here there's stuff like, you know, travel by horseback or by mount waterways, canals, things like that. But there is a section on here in here that specifically says to gun or not to gun. And Gary writes this whole thing here where he talks about, well, no, you shouldn't have guns. And he tries to say it's because once firearms were introduced, they changed the sort of medieval era that he's trying to replicate and what he thinks of as being like the quintessential fantasy setting for a fantasy role-playing game. And once you introduce firearms, you're getting out of that because um, things changed as far as like how, you know, who can use those weapons. You didn't have to have trained archers anymore. Just, you could have a peasant grab a gun and shoot. It didn't take a lot of training and things like that. So he writes this whole section of that. I think there's arguments that could be made that those are that what he says, you could poke some holes in that. But this is probably the closest you're going to get to why Gary thinks firearms shouldn't be in a campaign. So, um, you know, he and it's basically because it's going to completely change um, the everything, the economics and, and the politics and everything. Once you introduce firearms, it complete you you get rid of the feudal system and you start to get into more of like that, you know, age of enlightenment type era where, um, you know, science is king and that's going to change the way you look at a fantasy setting. So that's this book. However, interestingly, there's a follow up to this book called Gary Gygax's World Building. And in there, there's a whole section and tables for having firearms in a game. So um, yeah, he's saying he doesn't want them, but he's also going to work with the folks at Troll Lords to give you rules on using them if you want to have them in the game. So that's, again, I'm just coming back to my point that it's not always clear why Gary didn't like them, um, other than he just didn't like them. I mean, that's, that's basically what you can say about that. I know it's not a, a very definitive answer, but Gary just, just seems to like he's basing it on the kind of fantasy that didn't have guns in the campaign. So there's one more interview here that I saw on Dragon's Foot. This is 2005, and he was working on this game called Legendary Adventures, uh, Legendary with a J. And that's a fantasy game. But in there, in the interviews uh, on, on the forums, he says, but you could also play in other settings. So I'm working on rules for things like Wild West and other type settings. And he says, I have tables for firearms. And then someone says, can you share the tables? And he does. And the firearms he's talking about are way more modern. He's talking about... Uh, uh, you know, shotguns and machine guns and things like that. So he's still not doing those like medieval era, early firearms, like the Aquabus. He's not doing that. He's doing more modern ones, but he didn't really oppose to having firearms in games. He just opposed to having them in what he thought of as a, a traditional fantasy setting again. So that's going to wrap it up for my discussion on firearms and early tabletop role-playing games. I'd love to hear comments from you if you've played in a fantasy, traditional fantasy game, especially if it's an earlier one from 70s or 80s. I know they're much more common now, but I'm talking about like early, early games. Or have you played some of these ones that I've talked about? leave a comment below. Also below, you'll find places where you can join me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and where you can buy something from my shop, like a t-shirt or hoodie to help support my channel. I'm also doing a giveaway right now for having reached 2,500 subscribers. Please see my short video on 2,500 subscribers. You'll see it right down there in the shorts. They'll tell you how to enter the contest, which is going to, I'm going to do the drawing on August 31st of 2023. So if it's past that, you've missed the contest, unfortunately. But uh, until next time, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching. Happy gaming. Stay safe. And I'll talk to you next time. And now for the bonus content, what I was drinking and what I was listening to while I was prepping for uh, this video. So last night I made Italian food. I made a spaghetti bolognese for my daughter. Actually, she started uh, high school this week. And so I made one of her favorite meals that she always enjoys when I make homemade bolognese. And while I was making that, I was thinking of my notes from my campaign. I had my notebook out because there are a lot of times where I just had to stir the sauce, but I didn't have a lot else to do. And so I made a Negroni. It's probably one of my favorite uh, pre-dinner cocktails, especially uh, when I'm having Italian food. So this is equal parts gin. I use uh, St. George uh, Botanivore gin, Campari, and sweet vermouth. I used punta mess this time. So this uh, in Italian means, or in English translates to point and a half. It's a much more bitter sweet vermouth than traditional, uh, which I kind of enjoy. I sometimes find the sweetness of Campari, even though this is bittersweet, a little too sweet. So I kind of like to balance it. 
with the Punta Mas. So perfectly balanced cocktail, uh, great for a pre-dinner, um, you know, aperitif, uh, you, you could say. Um, again, it is very bitter though. So if you're not used to Campari, you might want to test it out a little bit, but chin chin. Listening while I was, uh, cause I was making Italian food. I put this record on. This is the soundtrack to Big Night, a film from 1996 uh, with Isabella Rossellini, Minnie Driver, um, Stanley Tucci, and Tony Shalhoub. But it's got these great classic songs from sort of the 50s and 60s era. It's got Louis Prima, uh, Keely Smith, Rosemary Clooney. But it's also got some traditional Italian performers on here. You have Claudio, um, Claudio Villa. You have Matteo Salvatore. And then you've got all of the music from the score that was written by uh, Gary uh, DuMichel. So anyway, this is a great record. Uh, I had it on CD, but it just came out on vinyl a couple years ago for the first time. So I picked it up. All right, that's it. Thanks again for watching.